to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Welcome to IEP Radio. This is episode 29. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another Coffee Break series. Episode 28, we got done talking about IEPs, uh, what a good visual inspection might look like. We addressed sampling. We addressed uh, report writing and what that might include and entail. Thought we would take the time to explore the various types of mold samples that are out there, possibly their limitations, what they can and can't do. Uh, we had a recent request by uh, somebody on social media who posed the question, with all the testing options available, can you elaborate on each kind and its uses and limitations? And of course, I mentioned spore trap sampling, air, ERMI, gravity plates, and a few others. So I thought I would do my, my best to, to, to address that. Um, I'm going to pull up something on my screen real quick. I'd like to uh, pay a special thanks to a good colleague and friend of mine, Carl Grimes, who works with uh, Hayward Score, uh, who provided me with this recent poster, uh, which if you're watching right now, you can see has a list of different types of samples listed on the left side how they are collected, how are they reported in terms of units and what they can and cannot or potentially can and cannot detect. So thank you, uh, Carl, for that. And also thank you to uh, Bill Hayward, uh, the CEO of Hayward Score uh, for letting me take advantage in the right way uh, this information. You guys can learn more about uh, Hayward Score by visiting their site, haywardscore.com. Um, moving forward, uh, it's an important question. A lot of you folks out there are hearing all sorts of things, good, bad, and different when it comes to various types of samples. I'm going to use this as our guide today to um, walk you through what we know, the limitations of these samples, and we'll get right to it. If you're taking a look at the top left of the screen right now, you'll see that when we get to the types of samples, we'll start off right away with air samples. And as you can see, the first three samples that are mentioned there are culturing. This idea of using a Petri dish or an auger plate, a settle plate, and um, allowing mold to either be um, impacted on that auger plate through a sampler where a, a, a measured amount of air is drawn through a device like an Anderson 6. And, and, and then that is, of course, all interpreted and analyzed, and you could even get species uh, identification on that. That's a great tool that a lot of professionals use. Um, I would argue. Um, it, in, in the IEP world, I know a few colleagues that will do that type of sampling in addition to either MSQPCR, what you may know as ERMI, or even sport trap sampling, because culturing is focused on viable, what can grow. It's not going to identify non-viable. It might not even identify viable that doesn't grow in that particular auger, these different types of mediums that molds may or may be more apt to grow on. And episode two, we dive a little bit deeper into that, by the way, on IEP Radio, if you want to go back and listen to episode two. But it doesn't identify fragments either. Um, so I want to show you this video. Uh, Hayward Score uh, created this video, fantastic, um, showing an example of, of mold and how it all works. While I'm talking, I'm going to explain to you, there's a lot of different parts to mold, right? Most of us have thought, we've grown up thinking about mold spores. Um, most of us have heard about different colors and um, think, and some of us even think, not me, of course, but that, you know, if it's black, it must be the worst kind. There are various types and colors of mold out there uh, that uh, can probably be more harmful or certainly an inflammatory consideration for those who have chronic illness and inflammatory concerns, that sort of thing to mold, whether or not it's green, blue, black, brown, that kind of thing. But what I wanted you to see real, real quick is this part in the video about the fragments. And again, we talk about this in episode two, but this is something that a lot of clients I work with don't even realize. Um, depending on the study you read, there can be anywhere from three, five to a thousand, I should say three to 500 uh, fragments to every spore. There's way more fragments present typically in an environment with mold, especially as it dries up and decays, then there are a big fat spore. And that's going to play an important piece in our discussion when we get into the ability to detect or not detect those fragments. 
But I digress. This kind of gives you a visual of what that might look like. And, and, and even this isn't doing it justice because if you're doing the math, there's not quite 500 fragments or a thousand fragments, but these things are research. These are not just um, bar napkin theory. Uh, there are plenty of references. In fact, even on IEP radio, I have two references uh, on under the references section that show studies identifying these fragments to spores relationship. Okay, so why did I bring that up? Because culturing for the vast majority will not be able to identify those fragments unless it's got a nucleate center or something that can actually grow and it happens to be in a fragment, it's not. And that represents a vast majority. So it's limited. You might think or might think of this as it's not going to identify everything. The other thing I want you to notice as we're looking, if we kind of fast forward to the third line here, there's a lot of DIY kits. There are things you can buy at hardware stores. There are a couple of laboratories now that offer services where they can send you plates for a relatively low cost. Okay, pros and cons, let's talk about those. Well, we know for one, they're fairly affordable, depending on what you do and the analysis and these sort of like consulting services, follow up with the lab. Um, you can still get a lot done in your house, multiple samples for relatively cheap and some would even argue more than the cost of one or two ERMI samples. And that seems like a plus and I would argue it is. One of the things that these screening tools don't commonly do is speciate. And think about species of mold uh, like a fingerprint. If you were at a crime scene and somebody said there's mold there, that makes it difficult to know whether the mold was there because of some bad thing that happened in the home, like a water loss or just normal background mold that would commonly be there. We call this normal fungal ecology. If right now, as you're listening or watching this, Let's play the pretend game that you, you live in a home that just doesn't have any internal sources like mold gr growing underneath the kitchen sink or from a roof leak, that kind of a thing. You are breathing in mold, mycotoxins, fragments right now, and that's your normal background. If you are able to speciate the mold, it helps the inspector or the person who's trained, who's looked at thousands of these samples better interpret whether or not this mold may be coming from in the home, outside of the home, typically comparing it to some sort of outdoor control, whether direct, meaning they sampled outside or they have some database that they use, but some sort of thing to be able to cross-reference it and say, yep, this looks normal or no, this is elevated. You don't get the species when you typically do this, the settle, the home plates that are DIY. Again, that also deals with budget and trying to find something as affordable. Um, what I would tell you is that Professionally, we want to speciate whenever we can, but if you're in a situation where you're using a settle plate and you're ordering it online, to work with companies like Immunolytics um, as an example, because uh, these companies at least offer interpretation and guidance with the samples, whereas if you're ordering a kit or going to a hardware store and doing that, there's very little that can be helpful. And what, what my concern is for you is I don't want you to think you have a mold problem when you don't. Um, we all have enough stress in our lives. And so if, uh, if you don't know how to interpret that sample or you've gotten poor information because you've read something online and you think that just because something grows on the Petri dish that you must have a problem, you'll probably drive yourself nuts. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So really wanting to work with somebody, either an IEP professional, if they're going to do the Petri dish samples or with a lab who can provide you with some good oversight, who has background experience as well in investigations, site visits, that sort of thing versus uh, a true settle plate kit that you might get from a hardware store with little or no um, guidance and, and education on what that might mean. It's the difference between you having potentially a good day and a bad day uh, if you uh, in, misinterpret uh, the results. Moving forward, when we still talk about air samples, now we're gonna get into that topic of um, spore trap sampling. Done typically under a microscope, the analysis is microscopy. And this is similar in so much that it doesn't speciate, as you can see, it does not offer species. Um, what I will tell you is that it actually identifies total. So it will identify viable spores and non-viable spores. Will not identify those fragments. See, that's missing right there. Um, it will identify hyphal fragments, but those are different. Um, and those are like larger bodies of things that can be readily visually identified under the microscope, but it's not going to tell you the species by identifying the hyphal fragment.
So then what would be the advantage of using this? Well, the first thing that people talk about is typically cost. It's cheaper. Someone can show up to your house, put a little cassette in a pump, measure for five to 10 minutes, maybe take an outdoor control sample or three. And uh, the cost of that is relatively affordable. In my personal experience, the biggest limitation with spore trap sampling, and please understand that I've, I've collected thousands of spore trap samples in my career. I'm actually published with the EPA where we compared uh, spore trap sampling in a school gymnasium against ERMI sampling. And I can tell you that spore trap samples have their place, um, but they're, they're limited. How many of you listening right now have experienced uh, a classic example of an inspector that comes out to your home, takes a spore trap sample, maybe in the living room, maybe in the master, tells you that there's not an issue, tells you that you're fine, um, and then leaves. And then, of course, you get that information and you run into a brick wall when you talk with your clinician and they're saying, nope, you're still being exposed. And so you have this back and forth of who's right, who's wrong. Uh, first of all, IEP shouldn't be give clinical advice just for the record. Uh, but second of all, we don't, we can't really tell you whether you're safe or not safe. It's the job of the IEP in the, in the topic of mold is to help determine whether or not your house reflects normal fungal ecology. We hope that if it does reflect normal fungal ecology, of course, it's going to be um, good enough for you to recover or just be fine and not ever have any issues. But that's our goal we don't have a cheat sheet that says 14 spores is good and 15 spores is bad. In fact, depending on the time of year, seasonal changes, weather, all that stuff, the counts of mold in your house may vary significantly, uh, even day to day, if not hour to hour. So fine, spore trap sampling has its limitations. It doesn't speciate, um, it doesn't identify fragments. Uh, can it be a useful tool? In my experience, the most I've ever really gotten out of spore trap sampling for people who I work with who have a chronic illness and or a low dose environmental exposure concern is not with sampling the ambient air or the air in, uh, in the living room, but basically doing uh, what's called spore trap sampling. And I wanna share that with you um, real quick here, bear with me. Um, this particular type of sampling, oh, there it is right there. If you guys are looking on your screen right now, you'll see that, oh, look at that, there's a spore trap and it's on a pump. Except this time it's not sampling, this is a kitchen sink cabinet. This is not sampling the kitchen air, it's sampling a confined space, uh, the space that's underneath the bottom shelf of the cabinet. And I do think that spore trap sampling to help for what we call cavity sampling, picture this in a ceiling or a wall, can be a great tool to help people uh, identify sources. But other than that, I'm typically not a fan of spore trap sampling. Um, they can be supplemental and useful to help uh, bring additional or ancillary information. But I think you're probably going to be better off with some of the other methods, even culturing. I think I'd put more stock in it than I would uh, a spore trap holistically. And obviously there's exceptions and in, in all that, but we, we can't address every single one of those right now. Moving forward, there are um, other types of, um, I, we've seen these recently, pumps that you can rent uh, yourself and sample the air. A lot of the, the pros and cons that I've already explained to you are the same way. Um, so we can move on to bulk sampling. So bulk sampling, uh, two different primary methods of, of analysis. Uh, culturing, again, somebody sends off a sample, maybe it's a piece of moldy drywall and they wanna have it identified. Um, or maybe it is a um, sample uh, uh, bulk of insulation or something. You can have those things sampled and cultured and looked under a microscope to see what's on the actual surface of what you submitted. This is a, a, a great way. Culturing, for example, this first one uh, does give you the option to speciate if you have the laboratory do that and you'd have to probably request that and again this is this type of sort of thing is normally what a professional inspector or an IEP would be, know how to do not necessarily something that you would just know even what to select or even the paperwork that they might give you if you bought a kit may not give you an option for species but I digress you can get those things speciated and again it is only viable so if there's not non-viable stuff on there um, it'd be funny because you may not get anything actually growing, but yet, you know, there's growth right there. So that's an example of what we're talking about. Just if it doesn't, if it can't grow, it won't grow and they won't be able to 
colonize it and see what it might, what genus it is or what species it is. With my microscopy, um, imagine them taking that bulk sample and, and putting ultimately a sample of that mold on a slide, looking underneath it under the microscope and identifying it. It's not going to speciate it. Uh, will identify viable and non-viable um, uh, uh, spores, if you will. So it's not going to identify fragments, nor is the culturing. Um, but it's a great tool to identify something if you're trying to find a relationship. So here's the analogy. You have somebody that's in the house. They're doing samples. They're thinking that there might be contamination in the air or the surface dust. They see something that looks like a potential source, and they want to ID it to see if it's the same genus or species. And that might be a great way, a bulk sample. You've also seen people do this with swabs or tape lifts, which are near the bottom. In fact, we'll hit that real quick. Surface microscopy right here. A lot of times um, you can, again, uh, it's very common, even if we go back to this picture here, you can see uh, people swabbing to identify the mold or even potentially doing a tape lift to uh, get an identification of mold on there. Swabs are good because they'll allow you to culture down the road. Keep that in mind. If you did a tape lift, it stops right there. You only get to do microscopy. But if you swab it, the lab will give you the option um, to, speci uh, to speciate um, because you can potentially have it cultured. Now, that goes right back up to maybe you had a swab sample. They identified it to the genus level. And you're like, you know what? I want to speciate that. So you have them run a culture on it and see if they can speciate it. Okay. You don't do bulk samples typically to address exposure. Earlier, we were talking about air samples, and that's like the most direct way, right, to identify exposure, what am I being exposed to? But if you have mold growing on your wall or on your window seal or underneath your kitchen sink cabinet, you don't get to take a swab or a bulk or a tape and identify that mold and translate that into what you're actually being exposed to. It doesn't work like that. It's good to know that's there, and there is the potential for exposure for sure, but it's not a direct correlation. Moving on to a big one, uh, let's talk about dust. So dust sampling uh, has certainly been around for a long time, even before ERMI was uh, released and commercialized in 2006. Uh, we were collecting just dust samples and sending them off for analysis to see what that looked like. Uh, and when we were doing it, uh, it was uh, a microscopy. Uh, we were actually using a Swiffer cloth. And again, we were able to get uh, uh, total counts, if you will, no species, but we were able to identify what was settled. The reason that dust sampling is coming to limelight more and more is not just because of the advent of ERMI, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. I have a couple slides or a couple of documents I want to share with you, but because it gives us history. If you stop and think about it for a second, the air samples that you're collecting are typically short term, they're grab, five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute, maybe 20 minute, it's a moment in time. What was there 15 minutes prior? What was there 15 minutes afterwards? What was there yesterday and so forth and so on and all these things, it's a, it's a snapshot of time. Whereas the dust, and of course everything has its limitations, including those air samples, the dust can represent technically as old as the dust is in terms of history. So if you haven't cleaned your house in a month, you could loosely argue that this dust represents about a month of history of what may have been in the air. And now when we first started doing those sorts of analysis, we didn't have the database that some of us IEPs have now, but fast forward from the early 2000s till today, and um, some of us IEPs are, you know, we have databases that are hundreds of, you know, individual samples, if not more, that we can look at. And that's something I want to talk to you about real quick. If you know anything about ERMI, let me just pull this up real quick. Um, you'll know that this sort of dust sampling, there was a little bit of controversy that came out, a, a document, this one right here, came out in 2013 regarding its use. Um, and the whole argument behind it was that the uh, ERMI was meant for research purposes only for for study not for general public blame and use what they were seeing there were some validation methods that they still wanted to check out and, and, and we're not going to get into that 18 page document right now but just to say that it the the epa was seeing a lot of people misuse it 
you know, you're having somebody come out to your house or rather you collected that sample, didn't have a clue how to interpret it. You looked at the graph that the ERMI uh, uh, scoring provides and you freak out because you see that the score indicates that you have a high probability of a mold problem in your house. So, I mean, there have been stories about people who have sold their home or spent tens of thousands uh, of dollars in cleaning or potential remediation of things based off of scoring. For the record, I don't think I've ever really used the ERMI scoring as a tool to uh, interpret that environment. Myself and a few other IEPs that do uh, what you know as ERMI technically as MSQPCR, it's the DNA technology, we covered that in episode two some more, um, is we're looking at the individual species and their quantities and controls. I'm one of the uh, IEPs that's known to take outdoor control samples. How about that? To be able to reference it, right? What is normal? And um, what I can tell you is that I think it's a great tool. Um, I don't use the ERMI score. We talk about it at times, and sometimes it's interesting that it can correlate and all that, but there's this kind of a range of ERMI scores that really leave the, the client in the dark and is not useful and can, can lead to false negative assumptions, false positive assumptions, when at the end of the day, you want somebody who understands what is the physiology of these molds? Where are we collecting these samples out? What is the climate? What are the conditions that they were sampled in? And it's not straightforward. In fact, a lot of the ERMI kits that are available, and I go, this is bias obviously coming from me, but from my experience, a lot of them, a lot of people reach out to us because they don't know how to interpret them. In fact, their assumption is it's automatically bad. And in fact, in a number of situations, we look at it and we're like, no, it's not. And, 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 or we need more information. And, oh, and here's why. And we provide that data that shows why this is your normal fungal ecology. Aspergillus penicillioides is a known water damage indicator mold. Doesn't just grow in water damaged homes. It had to come from somewhere before it grew there. All molds originate at one point in their life cycle if you rewind the clock back enough outside. That said... Aspergillus penicillioides. If we found it in high count in a house in Arizona, we might be raise our eyebrows and go, hmm, there could be something here, a source inside the home. Let's go out to Miami, Florida now and do the same sample. They're, they're in tropical climates, that particular mold species thrives. And we've seen it in places like Florida along the East Coast there, uh, uh, Hawaii, and it's a normal background. But if you didn't know that information, you might take a sample in those humid climates and think you have a mold problem when it's just your normal background. Now we can dive in another episode deeper into, well, is that a potential health issue? And that gets into more doctor stuff um, and that sort of thing. But again, it's important to know that. And if you're just doing a kit, you may not be able to interpret that. So uh, as a general disclaimer, if you're going to get into ERMI samples and you can afford it, I would highly recommend that you work with an IEP, you can typically find resources on a couple of well-known websites. Um, Envirobiomics has them. The International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness uh, or ISEAI.org has a Get Help page, and you might be able to find somebody on there um, or even reach out to your clinician. But find somebody who is known to work with these samples because I'd, I'd hate to see, and what we often do see, are people that are just misinterpreting them and doing things that are extreme, including moving, throwing out books, throwing out clothing, throwing out sofas, throwing out uh, you know, $4,000 mattresses, only to find out that it wasn't nearly as bad as perhaps that celebrity blog you read about indicated. Um, that being said, um, there is uh, a couple of methods that are sampled, and I'm going to get into the hurts me piece real quick. Um, with vacuum beads and wiping. The original methodology for an ERMI sample was a vacuum sample. It was, a, it was using a special uh, cassette, five minutes, typically select, uh, sampled off of like say the living room floor and the master bedroom, sent off for this analysis. Uh, Dr. Stephen Vesper, who is a big part of, among other things, the uh, ERMI uh, um, uh, testing and research with the EPA, has done a number of studies. I've provided a couple here just to show you that this is a real thing. Um, comparing that original vacuum cassette test with what a lot of folks know now as more common, like a Swiffer wipe taken from elevated surfaces. And I'll just share with you that in the research and discussion, um, basically what you'll find is that they're, they're comparable in terms of their um, 
how they correlate, um, their ability to detect quantities and all these other things. Now, these, these um, studies were certainly focused on the ERMI piece of it, but the, the good thing about these studies is that it indicated that, you know, you can do that type of sampling, sampling from elevated surfaces and still get a meaningful result. And I would agree with that. One of the reasons why IEPs went away from fluorine was because we were afraid of false positives. Things settle in a sedentary environment, gravity wins. And you track things in, even if you lose, leave your shoes outside. Um, and, and that could potentially create false positives or even false negatives depending on the situation. Did you come from a moldy garden and you brought in some molds that would have made, made that group one water damage indicator mold list, but again, it had nothing to do with your house. It was just the garden. Or could you have tromped in a bunch of group two molds and actually lowered, uh, or I should say significantly increased if you are looking at the ERMI, which again, you know my feelings on that, um, and get a false negative. So I think the takeaway with the ERMI is, is that it is a great tool to use and, and, and but should be used in professional hands. And I know there's a lot of confusing information out there because you have clinicians and websites recommending some of them anyway, doing ERMI samples. But I think, I think that this perspective hasn't caught up with them yet. I think that maybe they don't realize that there's a lot of ways to get stuck in the data, not know how to interpret it. And if any of my colleagues are listening to this right now, they are probably in whole agreement that if you're going to do this, you really need to have an IEP who's versed with this type of sampling to help guide you through it. It doesn't have to be some long, drawn out relationship where you're spending tons of money, but at least that general education would go a long way. Um, Hurts Me Sampling, created by Dr. Shoemaker, was a method for helping um, provide a clinical piece to the, the environmental sample data. So if you know of Dr. Shoemaker, you, you can, or you don't, you can go to survivingmold.com. And what you'll find, I'm going to pull something up here in one second, is um, that he did a study on Ermes and he, then he created a new index called the Hertz Me. And the reason that the Hertz Me came out, it only looks at five molds, was because he was finding that through the iterations, uh, evolution of his own research that he needed a better scoring system that hired a, a, offered a higher level of confidence that an environment may or may not be safe enough, which I don't like that word, but safe enough for a person to um, live in and recover, assuming they had case-defined CIRS or chronic, uh, uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. This paper that I'm sharing with you uh, can be found on the Surviving Mold website, as you can see. And again, it, it goes into more of the research that was done. But what I'll share with you is that here's that comparison between Ermes and Hertzmes. And what Dr. Shoemaker found was that depending on what the Hertzmes score was, which can be found on the left side, the lower the score was, there was a better chance that you would not relapse. Is it a perfect science, perfect tool? Well, I'm sure even if Shoemaker was here, he'd say no. I've seen people with Hertz Me scores of 16 get better. I've seen people with a Hertz Me score of eight show indications that they're getting worse. But it's a great tool. And I do tend to agree that the correlation of Hermes, or Hertz Me scores, and if they're higher, does correlate with something not, not being right potentially. I think that the Hertz Me scoring is a great DIY wake up call if you are following or working with a shoemaker doctor and or they've diagnosed you with CIRS and again they're following that shoemaker protocol because now you have doctors that are kind of they say CIRS but then they're doing things that are not consistent with uh the treatment and all that but is that you can use it even as a kit as potentially a starting point especially if you have that spouse who doesn't really want to get involved a disgruntled husband that thinks all of this is crazy, thinks you're crazy, and is not willing to work with an IEP, not willing to spend the money to get the job done correctly, even though you're spending the money with a clinician to do it. Um, and instead, you're like, okay, well, a Hertz Me sample can, depending on the lab, you know, $130, $160 might be a great starting point to bring awareness to you and your spouse to say, okay, we know this is not the all seen eye. We're not going to figure out all of our issues, but this might give you an idea, a ballpark, if you will of what species may be in the, in the home and, and what that score more importantly is to indicate whether or not there's a concern there. 
I'm a fan of dust sampling. Um, I'm a lot of like anything else in life, it's like riding a bike. In the beginning, we were still learning and we didn't really have much to say about them. But I mean, it's been since 2006 where you know, this database that includes hundreds of samples and to be able to look at that and see patterns and relationships and to, and to use it as clues in concert with the visual or historic evidence is a great tool to help a person identify general exposure questions like does it reflect normal fungal ecology or not uh, and also potentially help narrow down or zone out home uh, areas of concern in the home so that's a that's a that's a good tool for you to consider if you're going to do the diy kits don't don't put all your hopes and dreams and to be able to interpret it but maybe a starting point like with the hurts me but know that ideally what you would do is reach out with an IEP and talk to them about your situation, figure out if even sampling is appropriate right now. Maybe there's some low hanging fruit issues that should be remediated or cleaned first, and then some follow-up sampling perhaps afterwards. But these are different sorts of tools and options that you can see. If you've been watching, you can take a closer look at this document, freeze the screen and, and see some of the, again, different pros and cons to each. Um, the one thing I did not talk about, I'll try to uh, talk about quickly is mycotoxin sampling. There is at least one lab that offers, um, and there, I think there's more, that offer mycotoxin sampling or analysis of dust. Um, and, 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 and for those of you who are working with a clinician where maybe they're looking at mycotoxins like urine analysis or something of that nature or in the blood, there's this thought that maybe you could sample the environment for mycotoxin and then there'd be a correlation. Um, I do know of a few colleagues that use these mycotoxin dust samples to help them with those questions, and they seem to like them. The one challenge that I see with mycotoxin sampling is not they're not being at least readily available to the public. A lot of background references, like what is normal mycotoxins in the home? Is it zero? If the lab identifies mycotoxins, does that mean you must have a source in the home or could that just be normal background, right? This whole thing of false negatives, false positives. It, they can be expensive, uh, like ERMI samples. And what I can tell you is, is consider this. If, if you're talking with an IEP and they bring up ERMI sampling, mycotoxin sampling, really, any of the ones that are looking more about exposure directly or indirectly, air, dust, ask them what constitutes a fail versus a pass. What is normal fungal ecology? What is normal mycotoxin ecology in the home? How do you differentiate that? If the lab comes back and says something exists, is that still normal or does it have to be over a certain quantity? How do they quantify the problem? Having it in the home, like having one spore of stachybotrys, for example, doesn't mean that you have a mold problem, despite some old great doctors that used to say that. That just be, might be normal background. So what is the normal background and what is that professional using to analyze the data? And if you don't get a good answer, if you get a black or white, like, oh, well, if it shows it present, then we're going to say that you need to do an environmental clean. Don't get me wrong. I can jump on that uh, bandwagon, too. Say, so just go ahead and clean everything. Let's be proactive. But that's not typically the issue when I work with clients. What I usually work with are people who are trying to be pragmatic, deal with budget, logistics. Of course, they want to honor their health, but they just gave, they were just given an estimate for $30,000 to clean their home because of a mycotoxin or an ERMI sample. What are these professionals doing to help interpret that data and get perspective? What, and do, does it feel like they do have a good database? Do they take control samples outside? That kind of thing to offer that perspective. That kind of leads to the point about DIY sampling, doesn't it? You, if you're listening, you may know that there are DIY kits you can order. It's the same challenge. How do you interpret it? Is having an ERMI score of an eight have to be a bad thing? Can that just be normal for where you live? If you find mycotoxins present in your dust sample, does that mean you have to have a source inside or could that just be normal background from the outside? We can talk about if it is from the outside, how to reduce those levels in another episode, you know, cleaning, filtration, removing reservoirs, that sort of thing, keeping the house closed up, all the things of that nature. But what we're talking about right now is even to get to that point of, is it coming from the outside or not? What are those people doing? 
I think that's a huge thing why I keep on talking about it is you need to have information and you need to have a discussion about what is normal or at least a range or at least some methodology to help interpret these samples because oftentimes they are not black and white. I want to stop sharing my screen real quick to talk to you about two other things that came up uh, in the questions that people were asking about with the different types of tools and techniques that are out there for sampling. Uh, some of you are familiar with uh, the mold dog. Um, I'll, I'll be short with you on this. Um, we know that mold, uh, dogs in general, um, and certainly depending on the speed, the type of dog, um, can have a nose that's 100,000 times or more sensitive than humans. Um, and that their ability to create more of a three-dimensional picture of the environment by being able to sense odors and smells from different parts of their nose can help them better locate sources and can be a great tool for sniffing out those sources. Um, we know that dogs have been used for decades uh, regarding military law enforcement, that sort of thing. We know it can be a, a great tool. Uh, dogs typically are honest unless there's some sort of um, conspiracy theory uh, going on with what the dog is doing to get an extra treat or something like that. But let's we'll exclude all that for now. I think what you'll find in many cases is a mold dog is, in a, in a way, similar to like a VOC beater, a particle counter. Um, a flashlight, a moisture meter. It is another way to help locate sources that are actively emitting even trace amounts of vault organic compounds, of which a lot of these dogs are trained to get the multiple, a multitude of them to identify sources. But what you will find is if the doc, dog identifies an area of concern, like let's just say next to your toilet, not like if the dog sits down and wags his tail once versus twice that he's saying there's one or two square feet of mold. He's not really quantifying the problem. He's not identifying the type of mold, or maybe it's even a bacteria. He's certainly not speciating it. And a lot of times what the dog handlers will end up doing afterwards is they'll do additional sampling. Like they'll use the dog as a precursor to screen the home. Of course, they're still using their eyeballs, a flashlight. And if they identify something, a potential source, they might end up doing additional sampling. Um, maybe a cavity sample or something like that, or an inspection or a boroscope to get into that cavity or that space where the dog has alerted to. In that respect, I have no problem with the dog being a great tool. I think that's, it's just knowing the limitations. I, I wouldn't replace an ERMI in the data you get from that in terms of quantifying the problem um, with a mold dog. A mold dog can't tell you what your normal fungal ecology is directly. Two barks is so many counts per cubic meter, you know, three barks is more. It, it's, it's a tool to help locate sources. The other thing that has been brought up is um, Instascope. Um, here's what I'll tell you about that. Um, first of all, an amazing technology, um, trying to take a particle counting to the next level with fluorescent uh, technology to help subcategorize particles of different sizes to perhaps like molds, pollens, bacterias. Um, I think it's a great screening tool like the mold dog, but in a different way. It's like a particle counter on steroids in that it can give you a little bit more information, but it's not telling you the type of mold, not even telling you the genus or the species, but just particle counts in general. And, and with that and the fluorescent technology, which you can learn more about on their website, um, it does offer a tool for trending like, oh, wow, the master bedroom looks worse than the living room. I wouldn't replace that type of screening tool with a, with a more forensic, more robust culturing sampling throughout the house or ERMI sampling or QPCR sampling um, throughout the house. Uh, because a lot of times, again, what you'll get into is what are the nuances? What are the margins of error? Could an elevation in the particle count indicate something other than mold? And what is truly background? I think we're still learning more about that technology. But if you look at it from a general screening tool, which if you go on their website, for the most part, you'll see that that's kind of what they promote. I don't have a problem with that. I think that the species and identifying the mold does matter when it comes to seasoned IEPs locating sources. Um, but the other reality that we're dealing with is that you might not have a mold dog. You might not have a seasoned IEP, but you might have an Instascope. If possible, I'd have you reach out to an IEP at least virtually first. Have them talk to you so they can learn more about your situation. Well, we have an issue. We don't have an issue here. Uh, this is obvious. This isn't. I uh, work with that IEP to um, prioritize things and come up with next steps. And that may or may not include any form of sampling or investigation, inclusive of uh, the, the, the different types that we've talked about today, mold dog, uh, Instascope, and, and the other types of sampling that maybe you can do with guidance. 
having an IEP direct you of how to sample in a certain way, being there to help you interpret the data is night and day difference than you doing it yourself. Well, that's all I have for you today. I hope that information was useful. I'll see you on the next one. The content of this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed. This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician. Additional exposure concerns and or questions pertaining to the health of your home or building should be addressed by qualified and on-site professionals. Any and all products and services discussed in this show should not be construed as a recommendation, endorsement, or guarantee that their use is appropriate for your situation. In short, we hope this information is of value to you, but please do not act upon it without actual and individual consultation and guidance by professionals who have taken the time and appropriate collection of data to assess your unique situation.